and welcome to this morning's program on using open source information to document war crimes and atrocities in Ukraine and beyond. We are delighted to have a distinguished panel of speakers this morning. Let me introduce them to you. First, Alexa Koenig, JD, PhD, is faculty director of UC Berkeley's Human Rights Center, winner of the 2015 MacArthur, oh, excuse me, MacArthur Award for Creative and Effective Institutions and a lecturer at UC Berkeley School of Law School of Journalism. She is also a co-founder of the Investigations Lab, which uses social media and other online information to strengthen human rights related legal investigations and investigative reporting. Alexa has been honored with the United Nations Association's SF's Global Human Rights Award UC Berkeley's Mark Bingham Award for Excellence, and as a 2020 Women Inspiring, Woman Inspiring Change by Harvard Law School. Her recently co-authored and co-edited books include Hiding in Plain Sight, Digital Witness, and Graphic, which is forthcoming. Hannah Bagdasar is the lead investigator for Bellingcat's Global Authentication Project, as well as an investigator in its Justice and Accountability Unit. Before she was working at Bellingcat, Hannah was an analyst at a United Nations independent investigative mechanism for Myanmar. Hannah has also served as an open source investigator and legal consultant, working with NGOs combating disinformation and misinformation as well as researching the use of open source information as evidence at the international criminal and domestic levels. In addition, Hannah has interned at the International Criminal Court in the Office of Prosecutors Preliminary Examination Section and was part of the first cohort of UC Berkeley's Human Rights Investigation Lab. Hannah holds an LLM in international on Twitter by car. and comparative law Are you going through at the a walk? University of Helsinki and a BA in legal studies from UC Berkeley. And if I may ask you, if you're in the audience, please mute yourself. Nathaniel Raymond is a lecturer at Yale's Jackson Institute of Global Affairs and the Yale School of Public Health, where he is lead of the Humanitarian Research Lab. Raymond was the founding director of the Signal Program on Human Security and Technology at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. He was also director of operations for George Clooney's Satellite Sentinel Project. Raymond has investigated mass atrocities and served as an aid work in multiple conflict zones, including Afghanistan, South Sudan, Ethiopia, the Middle East, Sri Lanka, and elsewhere. And Arthur Traldi. Arthur Traldi is a senior fellow at American University's program on technology, security, and the law, and a senior consultant with Lexpat Global Services. Arthur previously served as a prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia litigating cases involving charges of genocide, crimes against humanity, and violations of the laws of armed conflict, and in chambers at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. He is a co-chair of the ABA's International Criminal Law Committee. Arthur is a graduate of Georgetown University Law Center and the College of William and Mary. Before working at the IC and the ICTR, he clerked for Justice Deborah Todd on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and Judge Arthur L. Zulick on the Monroe County Court of Common Pleas. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. We are very excited to have this distinguished panel of speakers. And uh, to start, Alexa Koenig. 
Thank you so much, Susan. And it is such a pleasure and honor to be here with my fellow panelists whose work I so deeply admire. And of course, to be in conversation with all of you, who many of whom I know are also leaders in the space of thinking through how social media and our changing digital environment have really created new opportunities, but also new challenges in fact-finding for justice and accountability purposes. So I'm gonna kick off the conversation today by spotlighting a little bit about what even an open source, what open source information is, and a little bit about the context um, for all of our comments this morning. I'm gonna cross my fingers that sharing screen is gonna work. I, it looks like I may be having some challenges, so we will give this a shot. Um, and actually, it looks like my slides are not going to work. The good news is that I can go ahead and do this presentation without them. Um, so apologies for the technical challenges. But to start, um, about... uh, why don't you give it a try? Right, give it another try. Okay, just, say just... I'm going to have some security issues. Let me check and see if I can open this really quickly. Yeah, if for some reason it's not giving me a, the security ability to share the slides. I don't know if someone else would like to share the slides or I can just kind of talk through them. There's um, quite a bit that I can just talk through and illustrate verbally. Can I can share? Okay, great. So while we're getting started, um, in a nutshell, you know, over the last 20 years, we've obviously seen a massive transformation in the ways that people communicate, the ways that they communicate visually in terms of the photos and videos that are shared to social media platforms online, um, thinking about how over the last 20 years as well, act, commercial access to satellite imagery has become possible. There's been a decreasing cost for access to that information, which has provided new opportunities um, for people people to think about how we situate different atrocities around the world in both time and space. Approximately 10 years ago, our team began working with the International Criminal Court and other groups that were seeking legal justice and accountability for war crimes and other atrocities, um, and trying to think about how this changing information environment could become a rich source of information for ultimately bringing in new forms of data to complement what survivors have been saying in their communities. Um, next slide, please. Back in 2016, we began thinking about how more and more actors on the ground, whether they were investigative reporters or legal fact finders or human rights advocates, were beginning to comb social media for evidence of atrocities and hopefully capture that information in ways that could later be court admissible. However, there was also a lack of understanding for many of us operating in the space, whether we were lawyers or in another discipline, um, about how to actually go through that process. So I began getting a number of calls from people on the ground in places like Syria and Iraq, saying things like, people are sharing evidence of atrocities to me over WhatsApp. I'm finding them on social media. How am I supposed to be capturing and preserving these in ways that can be helpful for later legal process? And because there was a lack of understanding, we began doing quite a bit of research to find out what the guidelines were in different countries around the world for the admissibility and the weighting of this kind of information as evidence. And what we found is that while there were particular individuals who may themselves have a lot of knowledge about how this information could be useful, that knowledge wasn't widely disseminated. So in 2017, we began working with trial attorneys, with legal investigators, with investigative reporters, with technologists, to talk about did there need to be a set of international guidelines to help provide a foundation for the work that all these civil society actors were beginning to do. Just on the first day of the first workshop that we pulled together, we thought we'd spend about an hour or two coming up with definitions, common terminology that we could all be using about what we even call this new world of information. And what we found is that alone was such a contested issue, it took us over eight hours to even reach some very basic definitions, a total of five, around what um, the social media world was creating in terms of potential evidence. So one of the things that we did land on was the definition of Alexa, digital open source. set a source. timer for 15 seconds. For 15, okay, so digital open source information, which is ultimately information on the internet that any member of the public can access by observation, by request or by purchase. With, in order to get access to this information, it has to be information where you don't need a special status, like law enforcement status, issuing a subpoena or a warrant. It also doesn't include information that you engage in some kind of illegal activity to access, like hacking. 
Ultimately, we worked with over 150 people and hosted a total of five workshops to launch in December 2020 in partnership with the UN's Human Rights Office, something called the Berkeley Protocol on Digital Open Source Investigations, which hopefully provides a basis for a lot of the civil society actors who are thinking about social media content as evidence to think about everything from the ethics to the legal frameworks in which they're working, to the digital, physical, and psychosocial security issues that working with and handling this kind of data creates, to how to document and preserve some form of chain of custody for digital information, and ultimately how this can be useful downstream. Next slide, please. So the workflow that we're really thinking about at any given time is first of all, how civil society and those most affected may be capturing evidence of atrocities, to where they may be uploading it in digital spaces where it can be found and discovered, ultimately collected and preserved, ideally to some sort of forensic standard, then analyzed for its probative value, and ultimately fed into a number of outputs that are designed to effectuate change, whether through legal cases, reporting, and other forms of stories, and or some kind of diplomacy. Next slide, please. Another challenge, of course, though, is whether there needs to be the creation of an international evidence locker. As we know, social media companies are increasingly taking down social media content that may have value for court purposes. Often it's the most graphic and egregious material that is the very material that algorithms are finding and deleting before eyeballs can find it and ideally preserve it. So we've been actively working as have a number of other organizations to figure out how when they, when they take down that information, they can be sending it to some kind of international mechanism and ultimately collecting, deduplicating and analyzing and verifying that content so that later when war crimes investigators may come looking for information related to specific incidents Incidents. It's available, it's been carefully preserved, chain of custody has been documented so that ultimately it can have value for later court purposes. Next slide, and then I'll be wrapping. We recently learned that the government of Ukraine, the prosecutor general, has declared that they will be collecting digital information to the standards of the Berkeley Protocol. At this point, though, what is additionally needed by all organizations that are working with the protocol itself is the development of their own internal methodologies and standard operating procedures so that they can be even more specific in how they build from the protocol up. So things like the specific workflows that they're going to put in place that are in concert with the protocol also the specific tools that they will use for everything from capture to analysis to the outputs that they're creating. Um, ultimately, I know there is Ukraine is creating an opportunity for many of us who've been looking at other crises in Syria and Myanmar and beyond to think about how we all work together to develop these kinds of workflows to ensure that the labor that people who are most affected by these crises, the labor they're putting into capturing and documenting the crimes to which they're witness can have the maximum value and hopefully be useful for seeking accountability downstream. So with that, I'll go ahead and close. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alexa. That was tremendous and very timely. Um, let's turn to Hannah Agdasar at this moment. Great. I'm going to try to share my screen and hopefully this works. All right. Do you see... Slideshow. Do you see this slideshow? Great. Okay. Uh, so I was asked to speak a little bit about the methods that go into verification of a piece of open source content, like social media. Um, sorry. Can you see, you can see my slideshow, right? Not my notes that I have in front of me. Great. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I was asked to speak about verification. So verification is the process of evaluating the reliability of sources and content. So basically it means we're looking at different aspects to assess the authenticity of something. And verification is particularly important when you want to take a piece of open source information and have it be used to potential evidence. And you can check out the Berkeley protocol that Alexa just mentioned for a more in-depth explanation, but I'm going to hit on a bit of specifics and then I'll walk through a geolocation example, which is what I have my uh, slides up for. But so for authentication, you're going to need to do a source an analysis, 
looking for basic signs of manipulation, then do a technical analysis and taking steps to see if a piece of content is really portraying what it says it is. And so under the sort of umbrella of authentication, there are things like chronolocation, where you're using different methods to try to find uh, what time something, uh, what time it, the event depicted took place, where that's looking at shadows, uh, lengths of shadows or weather, weather conditions. And you can't do this with other, everything, of course, but you can at least know what time a piece of content was uploaded. And then from there, work to find the first available copy online and go from there. Another part of verifying something is the geolocation. So that's being able to find the exact coordinates um, of what an image or video is depicting and matching up objects and landmarks uh, in the video as much as possible using things like satellite imagery and other pictures, uh, et cetera. So I understand that all these are just open source jargon to you. So I prepared a quick geolocation example to illustrate this more clearly. Um, and these are just things that you could be doing as part of the verification process. So I purposely chose a non-graphic example from Ukraine to illustrate some steps that could take place within geolocation specifically. And of course, because of time, I'm going to skip over some things, but I thought it could still be nice to cover. So let's see if this works. Okay. So for this first thing, you'll see a tweet of what claims to be a Mariupol and a smoking building. Um, you'll see there's this grassy-ish area and a big, um, it says shopping center and warehouse here. And so you look at this and you ask, how do I geolocate it? So we take a better look at the image. Sorry, better look at the image here. You get a little bit more context. So then maybe we decide to take a look at satellite imagery from Mariupol. Taking Mariupol as just a starting point, we'll have to eventually check that. But being that Ukraine is such a large country, it never hurts to use these, uh, st these clues as starting points. So you'll have to check everything over again. Um, but as you can see, Mariupol is quite large. Uh, so then using another clue in the original tweet, I Google shopping center Mariupol, Ukraine. And you'll see, I'm just trying to narrow my scope of places uh, that I'd be looking. And you'll notice there's still a lot of shopping centers in Mariupol, and there would be even more if I searched in Ukrainian or Russian. So then I modify my tactic, and I find on Twitter that someone else has already geolocated it. So I went to these coordinates. These are the coordinates that I found on Twitter. Uh, and I'm looking and I don't see any particularly large uh, warehouses like I did in the original image. So I think maybe this is where the, the video was taken from and someone on Twitter geolocated it there. Maybe this isn't the right location at all. So then I just zoom out a bit on satellite imagery to see if there's anything else that could potentially be this. And so I zoomed out here from that coordinate that I had found on Twitter. And you'll see in the distance, there are a couple of large buildings that could maybe be um, a big warehouse and shopping center like the first tweet depicted. So at this point, because I'm just starting out, uh, I'll start looking through what else is out there about these big buildings. Uh, because if you remember from the first image, there's grassy area, buildings in the distance, and smoke. So I start clicking on these images, and I remember that there were these big block letters. So I'm looking, does this match up? Hmm. And just looking through all the different available photos that are out there on these buildings that could be it. So like I said, it's a very um, sort of guessing game here. So I keep looking. This could be it. I remember those block letters, but then I decided let's go back to the original. And you'll see in our original photo, there's the smoke, the large area, but then in the middle, this distinct orange triangle. So then I decided maybe I need to start looking for the distinct orange triangle. Uh, and luckily I found it right next to, uh, right next to the other 
places I looked at. So epicenter K. Uh, then from there, it turns out that epicenter K is actually a chain store. So then I needed to do an evaluation of all the other stores uh, here as well. So obviously I skipped a lot of steps here, but I was trying to illustrate that how you can get from this tweet to finding a geolocation. And that's just one of the many steps that we'll need to go into the process of verifying something. So yes, I found the location possibly, but then you need to go through and try to find the time that this took place and everything else that goes with that. Um, and now before, I know I'm running low on time, but before I hand things off to Natty, I wanted to say that like our new Justice and Accountability Unit in conjunction with the Global Legal Action Network has been developing one of these standard operating procedures that Alexa uh, talked about to be in line with the Berkeley Protocol to do this type of work that I just showed you, but in a way where you can really see how I got from A to B. Uh, so in a way that's transparent and replicable and that this type of work and analysis can hopefully be used in national, regional, and international courts. So I hope that you can see from this quick verification uh, example that a lot of uh, effort goes into it. And so there's this need to follow things like the Berkeley Protocol because it has to really lay out how you got from one point to another. And with that, I'll give it to Natty. Thank you, Hannah. Um, that was really fascinating. And for uh, those of you who are interested, there's a link in the chat to the Berkeley Protocol. Um, and Hannah, if you have any links you want to throw in the chat, it'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, we'll turn now to Nathaniel Raymond. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay, Susan? Thank you. Uh, so it's ironic being the satellite imagery um, uh, person on th this panel that I will not have a deck uh, because uh, more than anything, what I want to try to accomplish today is one thing, which is to really communicate the past 20 years of history, specifically as it relates to the role of geospatial information and satellite imagery and earth orbiting sensors in transforming open source uh, intelligence work as it relates to collecting evidence of war crimes and really try to do two things with this history. One, give you context for how it's really evolved in the past approximately 18 years, while also trying to show where it's going and the challenges and opportunities that I think now everybody who does this work um, faces, because here's the headline. Um, we are all uh, remote sensing consumers now. <laughs> and uh, that wasn't always the case. And uh, to look back, I wanna start us in, of all places, Fallujah in 2004. Um, US Marines and SEALs were hunting Abu Zarqawi. You may have seen the movie American Sniper. It was within that context that Marines started using Excel spreadsheets to do something that is now called uh, ABI or activity-based intelligence because they faced two big problems. One, they had overwhelming amounts of different types of intelligence coming from multiple sources, in many cases, drones and satellite imagery. They're also beginning to use open source, including Google Earth, early, very early versions of Google products to try to fuse together information, some of which was classified and some of which was unclassified, and they couldn't analyze in the same environment. So they had to get what's called temporal spatial differential cross corroboration, which in English means to compare time and place data across many different sources and to see where. And so that ABI methodology really began in Fallujah and it sounds common sense, um, but let's cut forward a year. I was in Katrina uh, with Oxygen America and the Katrina response in Biloxi, Mississippi, and we faced a similar problem um, in some ways, but a little different problem, which is we had a lot of information coming at, at us about damage. And this was in the early days, once again, of Google Earth, of mobile devices, 
et cetera. And we had very good information about primarily white parts of Biloxi. We had very bad information about the primarily African-American uh, sections of town. And I called that phenomena at the time, digital invisibility. And I wrote a memo to colleagues at Google basically saying, we need to start thinking about how we have data disparities in terms of seeing different populations in critical crisis events. And that memo sat in a drawer in the New York office of Google for five years until someone told George Clooney about it. And that became part of the basis of what would become the Satellite Sentinel Project, which was an effort to try to take in a civilian context, this ABI approach from Fallujah. And what if we started to use activity-based intelligence with commercial satellite imagery, which at that point had only been available for under a decade, um, to begin to try to do this temporal spatial cross corroboration, but over places that um, there was a lack of on the ground data. And to specifically use this, and I'm gonna use some jargon here, this mosaic effect of combining ground source reports with open source, non-imagery open source, so news reports, social media, with very high resolution um, satellite imagery. So when I say very high resolution, that means that one pixel is equal to about a meter or ideally sub meter. And here's some terms. Temporal resolution is how often a sensor goes over a location. And spatial resolution is basically pixel quality. How um, precisely can you see um, image, what, what objects on the ground? And so um, as I quote all the time, um, the late great Biggie Smalls who said, mo money, mo problems. I say, mo data, mo problems. Um, we have, when we started Sentinel, observing Sudan and South Sudan in 2011, when South Sudan was uh, becoming its own country, we immediately faced massive methodological issues. We would later face ethical ones, but it started with the methodological problem of stream of data, say a news report. How do we take a news report and put it into a database in a way that is mathematically sound? Okay, that's problem one. But then when we put that together with an image with different metadata and different granularity of metadata, how do we combine those two together in a way that retains the fidelity of the individual pieces of evidence but creates an evidentiary product that has combined those together in a way that doesn't put the chain of custody into a wood chipper. And a lot of, to put context at the time, I gave a very unpopular lecture at the International Conference of Crisis Mappers, where there was like one guy in the back clapping at the end, where I basically said that the crisis mapping revolution that came out of Ushahidi seems wonderful, but we were doing it without these standards of what happens when we combine threads together into a mosaic product? And, and at that time, we were doing mass mosaics. So um, I can go on and on here about the lessons of Sentinel. I just want to hit some highlights. With Sentinel, it was the first time that we caught a plane uh, in a unclassified environment, a plane um, bombing civilians in real time. It was the first time that we began to catch mass grave creation and the pattern of life in creating mass graves, alleged mass graves in Kadugli. It was the first time that we started to use MODIS, VIRS, and thermal sensors from NASA together at large scale to detect village burning. And it was the beginning of creating uh, tradecraft for how do we uh, formally ascribe responsibility for arson in rural African contexts. And so Sentinel really became a methodological lab, but it also became an ethical lab. The problems that came out of that were, how do we protect ground sources? How much information do we show in an evidence product um, to prevent its weaponizability, especially when it's being deployed in an active ongoing kinetic context? Um, we resolved none of these questions. 
These questions now for those who are working on Ukraine are just as urgent and just as potentially um, dangerous, maybe even more so, frankly, than they were when we were doing Sentinel 10 years ago. And well, our methods and our thinking, and I'm pointing at Alexa with Berkeley Protocol, our doctrine has improved radically. So has the tradecraft of the perpetrators. And that's what I want to end on is that in Syria in 2012, we were watching bombardment of palms about to begin. We saw the artillery move into position, multiple rocket launch systems, and then the images went dark. I don't know if anyone can guess what happened. The Syrians blew up an oil pipeline, sending high particulate smoke into the air, which caused the cloud algorithms, the cloud shutter on the satellites to turn off. It was ingenious. At the moment the artillery began, the air was filled with smoke and we couldn't see. When the smoke cleared, there was rubble. And so we are not the only ones who are learning. <laughs> and <laughs> we are not the only ones who are innovating. Um, our main problem right now is not technological. We have two problems. One is political and one is coordination. On the political side, and maybe Ukraine will be our moment, where the broad-based structural changes in law and in regulation in the United in particular, but not only, that need to happen to create a common American vision of how this information will be preserved for international justice has not happened. <laughs> it needs to happen, and maybe this is the moment it will. On coordination side, we have more and more organizations doing this, sometimes with more training, sometimes with less. But the challenge now is professionalization and preventing redundancy to make sure that as more organizations and individuals with very good intent surge into this space, that we are not creating um, damage to the chain of custody and to the quality of evidence products. So this is a moment for us to celebrate how far we've come, but a moment to realize that our solutions going forward are not technological. They are political and they are professional. Over. Thank you, Nathaniel. That was so interesting. And if you have suggestions for uh, issues that you'd like to see a group of very smart lawyers work on, um, please reach out to us or uh, throw it in the chat right now. And now- Email incoming, Susan, email incoming. Thank you, thank you. Um, and now we'll turn to Arthur Traldi, who, um, has had to grapple with some of these evidentiary issues at um, in his practice. Good morning, Arthur. Thanks, Susan, and good afternoon here, and good morning to you. <clears throat> it's an honor to be here with all of you, and, and particularly with these distinguished panelists. I want to start by being clear that unlike many of them, I haven't yet done any uh, investigative work in Ukraine, and so I'm not commenting particularly on how any of this works there or on, on any allegations. And you should also understand, of course, that I'm just speaking for myself. With that said, I'm gonna talk a bit about the value of open source evidence, the potential value of it, and where it fits in an international atrocity crime case. And I wanna start with a few core observations. First, that the general issues we face here aren't new or unique to international atrocity crime cases. Uh, we can learn from domestic law, and as lawyers, we can learn from international tribunals using lower tech evidence. For instance, the Leiden guidelines that came out this week on data-derived evidence cited ICTY for a variety of principles about the reliability and admissibility of evidence, even though the internet was still in, in its infancy at the time. They were just discussing what was particularly high-tech evidence at the time. Second, Proving war crimes in a situation where you are looking into allegations that many of them have been committed requires mountains of evidence. I don't believe that will change. Just to take one example from my own practice, at the beginning of the public delivery of the judgment in the Mladic trial, the presiding judge said, 
that the chamber had sat for 530 trial days, received the evidence of 592 witnesses, and admitted nearly 10,000 ex exhibits into evidence on top of taking uh, judicial notice of thousands of facts adjudicated in earlier ICTY trials. That was at transcript page 44,907 of the transcript in the case. Open source evidence won't turn that into a 49 page transcript. Third, proving such crimes to a criminal case standard takes years. That too was true before the advent of what we now consider high-tech evidence and it remains true. And fourth, open source evidence is both potentially really valuable and like any other piece of evidence, limited in what it will prove. And I, I think there are three different issues that you would look at if you were looking at, say, an example like what uh, Hannah was describing being geolocated. And I'll, I'll describe them in very broad terms. First, is this something that happened? Did this building get hit? Um, second, is it a violation of the law of armed conflict under those circumstances? Is it a crime? And third, if it's a crime, who's responsible for it? And in particular, you may wanna consider if you're investigating a large number of crimes, where on the chain of command you can ascribe responsibility, whether it's just the person who fires that particular projectile or whether it's something that is uh, something they were ordered to do and that person may bear responsibility if it's part of a pattern of conduct. Those things will require more detailed evidence than geolocating an image. That, that's kind of inevitably true, right? And I think of two examples maybe, one practical, and I'll come back to something like her, her image as a hypothetical, when I think about that. The first is the appeal judgment in the first international case, which was based heavily on high-tech evidence, in that case, cell site location data, came down last month in the Ayash et al. trial at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Even though the court in question could conduct in absentia trials, so there was no delay associated with getting accused persons into custody, and even though only a single bombing was charged, rather than long-term patterns of conduct uh, involving dozens or hundreds of sites, as was the case in the leadership level cases at ICTY and some of the cases at ICTR and ICC as well. The appeals judgment came down 17 years after that single bombing, the assassination of Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri of Lebanon, it came down 11 years after the indictment and more than eight years after the prosecution's opening statement. We can learn from that experience and perhaps find more ways to use tech to expedite proceedings. But I don't think it would be right to think that open source evidence will allow us to get to the point that you know, there's a, a shelling one month, we geolocate it, the next month somebody is charged, the next month there's a courtroom trial, the next month there's a judgment. Um, and so not, not to be the cold water on, on the optimism of all of this person, but let's remember this is gonna be a small part of building the case. And most of us know that's no surprise in the law. I checked as I was getting ready to talk about this and pulled up a couple of recent Supreme Court opinions. And in January of this year, the US Supreme Court vacated and remanded a lower court opinion in a recent case, um, not deciding the case, just remanding it for further proceedings. Uh, and that's where it stands six years after the suit was filed. They were remanding a, a decision on a motion to dismiss, so it's not clear if the complaint is sufficient to go forward yet. So it's not unusual that the wheels of justice grind slowly, and it's not surprising, particularly in this context. To see how that might work here, imagine you were charged with investigating a strike that hits a hospital with the goal of meeting a courtroom standard. Hospitals are among the most protected types of objects under international law. They may not be targeted unless they are being used for military purposes. And even then, if the circumstances permit, the firing party is supposed to warn the hospital and give it an opportunity to stop the use. And you receive open source evidence that shows the strike impacting. You're able to authenticate it using the eight categories of data that the Berkeley Protocol says documenters should be collecting to do that. You're able to geolocate it uh, as as Hannah uh, demonstrated and go through and say with some confidence, this is in fact the hospital in question, this is where we are. 
Indeed, it's a hospital. So people who are injured receive treatment and you're able to receive quickly their medical records and, eva and uh, evaluate evidence of those injuries. But until if you figure out if the hospital was what the firing party was aiming at, rather than just what it happened to hit, and until you figure out whether it was being used for a military purpose at the time, or whether the commander who ordered the strike reasonably believed that it was, you don't know yet if you even have a crime. And if you are asserting someone was killed in this unlawful strike, you'll also need to show they were present, which may not be accompanied by the same type of medical documentation. It's unlikely you can answer those questions with the same evidence, though you may be able to find some other public material that assists in doing that. And of course, once you're satisfied, you've proved those things and want to figure out if you can ascribe responsibility to someone. For this attack, you're also going to need to know which side fired, who the commander was that ordered it, whether they needed approval in advance from someone else, who that person was, what disciplinary authority that person may have had over them if they found out afterwards about what had happened, and how all of this worked in practice, not just on paper. If you're going to suggest a pattern of criminal conduct, you'll need to do this rigorously for incident after incident. I think that hypothetical is a good illustration, and I'm going to leave it there, because it also shows the value of open source evidence. Of course, it would be easier to investigate and prosecute that incident when you have video of the impact, when you are able to geolocate it, when you are able to authenticate that video. And it seems to me an investigator would be pretty happy to receive such evidence if they were able to authenticate it to a criminal law standard seems it would save them some amount of time. But it's not gonna replace entirely the teams on the ground, the witnesses, or the insider evidence that you need in order to prove up a case like this. So I think the general kind of baseline that I'd wanna leave people with is there's value to this, there's value if and only if it's done at a high level of rigor that allows us to prove its authenticity. There's value, and we can talk more about this perhaps, only if you are able to explain the benefits of that rigor to a fact finder afterwards in a way that they will understand it. For instance, my recollection is that the trial judgment in that special tribunal for Lebanon case that I mentioned involves about a thousand pages that are devoted to talking about the science behind cell site location data. And it's valuable only if you're able to prove up the other things that you need to prove, the identity of your victims, the relevant information about them, the protected status of the, of the thing that's hit, and the chain of command and functioning of the organization that did the firing in a way that enables you to meet criminal law standards, international criminal law standards for ascribing responsibility in this type of situation. So I think I'll leave it there. Again, thanks for having me, Susan, and, and thanks to everybody else for a really interesting bunch of presentations. Thank you, Arthur. It sounds like we have a long way to go in getting the courts to accept the scientific basis of a fair amount of um, technical evidence. Um, I'd like to open this to uh, the audience for questions. Uh, we've already had one question from James Taylor, and that is, can geolocation be spoofed? Um, I can take a first shot at it, and then I'm sure Hannah can uh, jump in here. Um, it, it can be confounded, um, it can be muddled. Um, the, when we're talking about a specific sensor, it really depends on the sensor to talk about the degree to which it could be spoofed meaning falsified versus spoofed meaning confounded. Uh, but back to what I was discussing in terms of mosaic effect, that's why you, you always have to look for a multitude of intersecting data because nine times out of 10, it's not spoof. It's um, technical, um, absolutely unintentional technical variability across sensors. Taking an example in terms of cell tower data, 
cell tower data in downtown New York comes from triangulated pings that are very close together versus if you were in Iowa, those cell towers are significantly less granular because they're further apart. Is that spoofing? No, but it is a technical difference that's contextual. So what we would do to try to account for those contextual differences that can cause variability in the geospatial product um, is the same that you would do to, if you were concerned about a perpetrator attempting to remove data or to falsify data. Yeah, I totally agree with Natty. I think it's completely contextual. And I think that's kind of what Arthur was also saying is that we need to not look at these things in just isolated events. We need to contextualize them. We need to look at the cell tower, the satellite imagery, the witness statement, the video, and then put that together. If you're looking at one thing, of course it can be manipulated by bad actors, but when, in, when put in conjunction, then you're going to see the full picture, which I think is sort of the, the point of this uh, um, panel. If I can add just quickly three quick things on that as well. Um, I mean, one thing that you do certainly see are areas of satellite imagery that are blocked for political reasons. And I think that gets back to Natty's point that a lot of the challenges are in fact political, sometimes more than technical and what's technically possible. But that of course has also been used as an asset to try to detect patterns and signals in that noise. Um, for example, in the context of potential Uyghur detention facilities and some of the investigative reporting that's been done there, it was a pattern of what was blocked that became particularly interesting to investigators. Second, I think um, also just thinking about the work of everyone here, you know, that's one of the reasons why many of us are often pushed for peer review is because it is so easy sometimes to find some degree of confirmation bias so that it comes into the analytical process where some of the challenges may actually arise or having multiple working hypotheses about what it is you're looking at in order to um, enhance the rigor of the analysis analytical process. And then the final third thing I'd say is if you look at the cover of the Berkeley Protocol, it's a deep fake that we had deliberately made to put on the cover of the protocol, in part to just be a warning about how important it is to really go through a careful verification process. And so we had a contest online who could tell us where in the world the cover came from. And um, the people, the open source investigators who took a stab at it, a couple people did quickly realize that this was not a place that actually existed in the wild. Um, for us, you know, we would recommend always going through a three-step verification process for any piece of digital information, first analyzing any metadata that might be still attached to that digital item as a clue to where it might have been shot and taken and what it might actually depict. Second, really assessing the source and the reliability of the source for that particular bucket of information. And third, doing the content analysis part that Hannah so beautifully demonstrated in her talk. We have a question from Joanna van der Merwe. Um, before we hear from Joey, I just want to stress the important thing that Alexa said, which is we often think that this is X marks the spot in terms of what you can see in the data. She brought up the critical point that I don't want to give you a percentage here, but at least like a rough third of the time, what you are using this data for is to find blind spots and um, to see where, where there isn't activity or where you can't detect activity is often probative. And I mean that in the most legal, um, high orthodox definition of probative that, um, so we just thinking here in terms of what we see in the image or what we see in the metadata, we're also looking for what we don't see. And then the last thing I wanna say is that uh, Alexa's point and the Berkeley Protocol's point on multiple steps of verification and peer review is essential that if you do any of this, and we're about to hear a question from someone who I have used in red teaming, um, <laughs> set up a red team separate from your analysis, wall them off, and then have them attack you and build a culture in your team of absolute humility. If you can't get your ass kicked in doing this work, you shouldn't be doing this work. Over. Have we seen indications of how Russia may be adapting to counter the ability to use open source intelligence to identify actions in Ukraine? Yeah, I can take a stab at this at first and then Natty, you can hop on. Uh, 
Yes, we have. Um, we've been seeing a lot of accounts doing sort of bad OSINT where they're making mistakes that uh, on the surface look correct and you might be drawn in by these sort of lines and context that you see sort of OSINT practitioners doing where they match up things and they put things side by side and they put the satellite imagery and the photo and they say it's confirmed. But it's pretty easy to debunk if you do go through this sort of multiple verification processes that both Natty and Alexa described. And I think that's also why peer review, like they both described earlier, is super important because even if you as the lay person, you just take a second and sort of critically think about a type of content or a piece of social media, then you can usually with these bad, uh, bad OSINT examples can see it relatively quickly. And that's why we should also be critical of everything we see online within the context of conflict and in general. Uh, but yes, so short answer is yes, we are seeing it, but it should be relatively easy to debunk. Yeah, and uh, based on what Hannah said, it, it brings front of mind the, the clearest example so far. I, Triopal hospital attack where they um, there was an a, a faux OSIN um, uh, debunking um, through satellite imagery, but you could see in the screenshots that they were putting up that they had not selected the proper parts of the imagery catalog uh, in terms of what um, satellites were present at that time. And so they had either through incompetence or through intent had not shown um, the actual full amount of satellites that were over the area, which included the Maxar shot. Actually, it was Buka. Sorry, it was Buka, and it was the the bodies uh, in Buka from the Maxar analysis, and that was very easily debunked. But dot dot dot. The challenge here is once these false narratives using what appears to be OSINT methods go out into the wild, they are very hard genie. And if I can add, I think one of Russia's tactics has repeatedly been to, you know, there's kind of a win either way, right? So like if they're able to control the narrative by saying, you know, look at the satellite image, look at this um, photograph, and here's the true story. If they convince people, they've got this counteractive narrative that both Hannah and Natty have mentioned. But if people don't even believe it, then it's like, ha ha, look at how easy this is to trick people. And you can't trust any of the analysis that's being done by groups like Bellingcat or the Human Rights Center or other groups that might be putting information out there. So it's kind of a game that they're playing on both hands. And in some ways, it's a very clever game, which is another reason why this methodological rigor and standard setting becomes so important so that we all understand, no, there's a correct way to do this and to think about it. Um, there's a question from Christine Carpenter. How likely and how important do you think it is that judicial systems develop distinct admissibility rules for various types of digital evidence as opposed to applying existing rules and precedents, such as those for photo evidence being applied to satellite images and maps, by way of analogy? Oh. I, I just want to take a first stab to remember the first point I was going to make in my presentation that I didn't make is that, it, but it helps answer this question, is that the, the history of mass atrocity documentation um, goes back a lot farther than any of these methods. Um, some of the notable examples would be the use of photogrammetry um, by U.S. Army Air Corps to find the factories that didn't produce anything. That was some of the first evidence of the Holocaust put across FDR's desk was air analysis and the creation of standards for imagery analysis of train tracks going to factories where nothing came out of them. And so the, um, and that built at that time, it was, it was radical and, and, and new, but it built on previous standards for analog ground photographs. The, the point I'm making here is that the answer to your question, Christine, is yes, <laughs> which is both we must create new standards where new standards are required, but they must build upon the foundation of extant standards and antecedent practice, whether we are talking with photogrammetry analysis um, from Army Air Corps and then going forward to the SR-71 Blackbird evidence used in Sebrenicia, 
the, the sources and methods may change over time technologically, and we must be elastic as we adapt to that, but not so elastic that we ignore antecedent precedent, which is rich in the corpus of jurisprudence. Over. Exactly. And I think often you would have a witness be able to testify in court about the creation of a photo or a video that becomes really critical that may have been sourced, for example, from online spaces. Ideally, in our conversations with the International Criminal Court, they don't necessarily want a package from a civil society organization. They want that original package coming from Facebook or Twitter with all of the contextual information that companies like that will bucket around it. So you very much want a, this to look and sound like a duck so that they recognize what it is and we have those same safeguards in place. That said, piggybacking off what Natty just explained, there are some new methodologies like hashing of a video or a photograph to help establish that that video or photo has not been in any way manipulated from the point of capture online until it shows up in court. These new forms of showing chain of custody in the digital realm, I think are, are new things that we all need to get educated about so that judges and lawyers are familiar with what hashing is and what it can do in terms of um, helping us understand the reliability and authenticity of the materials that we introduce as evidence. I wanted to say maybe two things on this. And the first is to kind of re-articulate what, uh, what Natty said in a very legal way. And, and that's to say the rules are gonna be the same, right? If you, if you look at an international tribunal, you're gonna hear about relevance, reliability, and probative value as your standards for admission. If you look at a case in an American court, an American federal court, you're going to have volumes of rules of evidence and precedents interpreting them. How to assess those rules, that reliability particularly, is going to be consistent in some ways. You'll look at corroboration like what Alexa was saying, and it's going to be new in other ways because you'll look at new technological means of demonstrating reliability that are specific to this particular technology. And you'd expect as a smart litigator or a smart uh, investigator that courts will use that same type of model. Okay, here's the considerations they've used before. Here's how we can fit this unique technology into the way courts look at the admission of technological evidence more generally. The second thing I wanted to do though, just in, in response to the word admissibility in, in your question, Christine, is um, to use a phrase that you hear a lot from judges in international tribunals, which is that goes to weight, not admissibility. Um, and what that reminds you is that admissibility is only part of the battle. What you need to be doing is authenticating it not to a level that it'll get over the initial hurdle of admission, but to a level where somebody will be comfortable relying on it in a judgment, adjudicating the guilt or innocence of someone for the most serious type of charges in the world. And that's a little bit of a higher standard and requires proving it up in a way that really allows you to satisfy yourself. And I think I, I'm encouraged, I know, listening to some of the types of safeguards that folks here have described themselves taking uh, during the course of this call, but it's something that we should expect judges, prosecutors, investigators, and defense counsels to have very high expectations about and to test and vet as they would with any other type of evidence. Well, on that note, I want to thank our speakers, Alexa Koenig, Hannah Bagdasar, Nathaniel Raymond, and Arthur Chaldi, and for our unspoken but very much appreciated Zoom host and webmaster, Tim Franklin. Um, this has been a very interesting presentation, and it sounds like we've got a ways to go as lawyers to make sure that we understand the technology and we can explain it to courts and tribunals and um, have this evidence be admitted to prove war crimes and other atrocities. Um, if you do have questions for our speakers that we did not get to today, you can um, send them to the ABA Communities International Criminal Law Committee and uh, we will pass them on to our speakers. Thank you so much and it's been a pleasure.
Thanks, Susan. Thanks, everyone.